and I'm Sarah Watson. Welcome to tonight's show, How Lincoln Institutionalized Science and Technology in the Federal Government. This program is part of our series of Looking for Lincoln Conversations. Abraham Lincoln had a lifelong fascination with science and technology, a fascination which would help institutionalize science, win the Civil War, and propel the nation into the modern age. Lincoln, the Fire of Genius offers the first holistic look at Lincoln's fascination with science and technology. That fascination can be seen threaded through his remarkable life, his commitment to self-study and self-improvement, his career as a lawyer and politician, and finally, to his presidency during the Civil War in which science and technology played a key role. David J. Kent is a lifelong Abraham Lincoln researcher and a career scientist. He is the president of the Lincoln Group of DC and is on the executive committee slash board of the Abraham Lincoln Institute and is a member of the board of advisors for the Lincoln Forum. He has authored three books on Abraham Lincoln, including his newest, Lincoln, The Fire of Genius, and his previous Lincoln, The Man Who Saved America. For more information about Looking for Lincoln Conversations, you can visit our Looking for Lincoln Facebook page. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce David Kent. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to tonight's program. And I'm going to talk about uh, Lincoln and uh, his what he did to institutionalize science and technology in the federal government. Uh, now, that this is really mostly from one chapter of my book, Lincoln, The Fire of Genius, which looks throughout Lincoln's life at the, at the science that he knew and the technology that he understood, which is way beyond what most people believe, uh, how he implemented that and, and promoted that in his legal and his political careers, and then the importance of that during the Civil War and how he used diff did different things to institutionalize science and technology in the federal government. So let me get started, and uh, I'll start off by giving a little bit of context. Uh, the, in the first slide, the, if I can get to the next slide. <laughs> Not a good start. Okay, let's try now. Believe it or not, this worked before. Okay, David, I want you to click like in the screen where the slides are, just like click the PowerPoint presentation again and see if that like unclicks it. Click what? Like where the, like take the PowerPoint, like um, take it off the screen and like re-click on it. Okay, bring it back in and we'll try it again. We do apologize for these technical difficulties. Okay, let's see. I think this is gonna work. Okay, we're good now. Sorry about that. Oh, wait, it's coming. There we go. You got it? Yes. Fabulous. Should be on the second slide showing the little plow. Yep. Okay, so uh, sorry about that, but uh, basically I want to talk about uh, some of the technological advances in the early 1800s. So when Lincoln was growing up, the first half of, uh, of the first of the 1800s, when Lincoln was around, uh, there was some technological advances that were going on. And not surprisingly, since most people were farmers, a lot of that was happening on the farm. And some were very simple. Uh, for example, just, just as an example with plows, you know, Lincoln as a little kid in Kentucky was probably dragging a stick through the soil to create a little bit of a furrow to drop seeds in. Uh, then his father would have been using like a wooden mortar board to pull be either over his shoulders pulling or having horses pull it through the soil to create the furrows. Then there was cast iron plows. Then there were cast iron plows with ex replaceable parts because cast iron uh, could get very fragile and break. And then this is uh, a John Deere steel plow that didn't come around till after Lincoln was no longer on the farm, uh, but it was the precursor to all of the nice green John Deere machinery we see running around today. So all of that was happening during this 1800s. It was also things 
especially later in that second uh, first part of the eight, 1800s where uh, Lincoln was involved in seeing things like reapers, you know, you know the machinery that would be pulled between behind horses or oxen that would help cut the, the wheat or cut the corn and then push it off to the sides so would be easy to collect instead of going through with a hand scythe. So there were this technological advancement. Lincoln himself, even growing up on a subsistence farm, very poor in the frontier, in Kentucky and in Indiana especially, you know, he even, he experienced and started learning some science. There were obviously agronomy, you know, the soil, I mean, uh, crop science, where to plant crops, how to plant them, all of that, but also soil science, soil nutrition. Um, there was forest ecology, did all these different kinds of trees and how to cut them down. And some of them are easier than others. Even things like finding uh, foraging for food while well, before you could, your crops were grown to find out, you know, which was good to eat and which would kill you. So there was a lot of things like that. There were also trees of different types that some were good for splitting into rails for fences and others were good for making log cabins. Uh, so we learned some, some uh, civil engineering, you know, through, through all of this. So there was a lot of stuff he was kind of picking up along the way. And I talked in depth about what all of this was. And it was a lot more science there than people think about. But this period was also a growth in steam energy, especially railroads, which mainly started in the east and slowly worked their way west uh, towards Illinois, which was the west at the time in the early 1800s, uh, as the people were moving further and further west. There was also steam, uh, steamships, and they really ran on the Ohio and the Mississippi River in particular in inland, and they really drove the economy back then. Transport and, and commerce was done on steamships, north to south, mainly going down the Mississippi River to, to New Orleans. Lincoln had experienced this on flatboats and then taking steamships back up, but he also played a major role when he was a lawyer in pushing things from steamships towards railroads. There was a Effie Afton case in particular where the Effie Afton, a steamship, uh, got, uh, uh, ran aground or ran into the, the pylons of the very new uh, first railroad bridge across the Mississippi River, burned the steamship to the ground, uh, damaged the railroad bridge so that they couldn't run trains over it, and then the steamships sued the railroad. And Lincoln was able to convince enough jurors that, you know, maybe it was really the steamship did this on purpose, and and railroads were able to get the, the bridge back up and to run. <clears throat> this completely changed things. Now, instead of this north-south on steamships, it was going to be railroads going east to west. And there were other things that Lincoln did as a politician and, and as a lawyer that promoted the idea of technolog technological growth. Now, there's one more piece of technology that I'll mention that grew during this time, the telegraph. The first telegraph message was sent in 1844, not that long, 15 or 16 years before the Civil War. It grew in the, eight, in the 1850s and then really got its use as first time in wartime during the Civil War. Pre prior to the Civil War, wars were the president or the leader would send out the generals and he basically wouldn't hear from them and he would hope they would come back. Uh, now Lincoln could really kind of communicate and even control and coordinate with generals during the Civil War. So the telegraph became very important. Now, all of this technological development or most of this technological development was occurring in the North. <clears throat> the South really disdained the idea of industrialization, of mechanization, of manufacturing. They really thought that it was a threat to the uh, aristocratic uh, concept of very few people holding most of the wealth and controlling most of the economy with the plantation owners. They thought it was a threat to slavery. So they really didn't want to pay anything to do for that, with that. That made a big difference. And Lincoln understood this when it got to the Civil War. 
So all of these things were sort of happening. Lincoln was picking up on these very, very quickly, scientific and, and technological advances and understanding the importance to the common man. Up to this point, most of this was, was helping rich people. But he saw this as a mechanism for helping normal people, farmers and everybody else. And that plays out as we go through into the Civil War. Now, again, before we get to the Civil War, there was one more piece I want to mention. Lincoln, of course, I think most people on this call know that Lincoln's the only president with a patent. And this patent, this model is in the Smithsonian. Sometimes they put it out for display. Uh, <clears throat> it incorporates the Archimedes principle of buoyancy and and displacement. There were also things like levers and, and use of block and tackle for uh, a mag magnifying power, all sorts of physics type things that were built into this that Lincoln understood. And he did created this, submitted the patent and got a patent. So he remains to this day the only president with a patent. Now he is not the only president who invented things. Obvious, most obvious person that people think of is Thomas Jefferson. And if you go down the road from where I am in Virginia, go to Monticello and they'll take you through on the tour and they'll say, oh, well, you know, Jefferson invented this really cool clock. He invented this uh, rotating desk that you, where you can have books, several books open at the same time so you can do research. He invented this, this, uh, this portable desk invented this cool thing where you could write a letter and it would copy that letter onto a second piece of paper. So he did all of these things, but he never patented any of it. Now, all of these things also, you know, they made Jefferson's life easy, but they didn't really trickle down to anybody else. They didn't really help anybody else. And he didn't patent things because he didn't believe in the patent system. Even though as Secretary of, of State under Bosch, George Washington, he would have been in charge of the patent office. <laughs> But he, he didn't think that was important, mainly because he grew up in wealth. He grew up with very high level of formal education, and he grew up with and later owned himself hundreds of enslaved people that did all of the labor. Lincoln came from a totally different place, so it gave him a totally different view on things. He thought that patent the patent system was incredibly important to the common people. At the very end of a lecture that he gave in 1859, I gave it several times, called the Lecture on Discoveries and Inventions. He gave, he talks about the patent system. He says, before the patent system, if you invented something, your neighbor could copy it, that was the end. You know, you didn't have any, any way to make any money off of it. But with the patent system, the inventor, at least for a certain amount of time, maybe 15 years, had the exclusive use of your invention. And that added the fuel of interest to the fire of genius in the discovery and production of new and useful things. Now, of course, I've used fire of genius for the title of, of my book, and it refers to the innovation, the invention, the creativeness, that side of things. But Lincoln thought that the, that the other side, the fuel of interest, the fuel of financial interest created by the patent system was just as important, especially for people lower down the food chain on the economic level, because this allowed people to benefit. They could commercialize their invention. They could make money off of their invention. So he thought that this in science and technology, which in the past really was good for rich people, could actually be good for everyone and could help place the United States on a path towards the future. So that's kind of, you know, giving a, a, some background and give some context. So we jump ahead now to the Civil War. And at the beginning of the Civil War, virtually no federal level of support for science. The science that we had up to that point mainly private clubs of men of science. The word scientist didn't even get invented until the 1830s. So you had men of science and then wealthy elites in places like Boston and Philadelphia and New York where there are larger populations. Uh, there were things like the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia, which was built upon Benjamin Franklin's Hunto and the American um, Philosophical Society, which uh, APS still exists. We did get later on closer to the Civil War, 
the 1850s, there was the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the AAAS, um, that came off of the American Philosophical Society. There was even really this group called itself the Scientific Lazaroni, led by Alexander Dallas Beach, we'll talk about in a little bit. But all of these were private groups. They were very ivory tower. Literally, you would have a bunch of wealthy people or people supported by wealthy people who had a lot of time and a lot of education, who would literally go from house to house and sit there and over cigars and, and brandy and philosophize about science. Because science was called natural philosophy at that point. It was very little formal science and the federal government had almost no support for science at this time going into the Civil War. The exception was this building, the Smithsonian. At the time of the Civil War, this was the Smithsonian Institution. It was the only building, the Smithsonian Institution. It had been laid the cornerstone when Lincoln was a congressman in 1847-48. So he would have come down and watched it being built. But it, it was, that was it. And it, it really, well, there was a couple of other things. It was a Coast Survey and there was a U.S. Naval Observatory. But these were mainly services that helped the, the military. The Smithsonian was the only real science and it was run by this guy, Joseph Henry. Joseph Henry is the first and at this point, the only secretary of the Smithsonian. He was the one who was put in charge of using the money that we had gotten from James Smithson from England to build a Smithsonian institution and decide what to do with it. And he saw the, the Smithsonian as purely a scientific research organization would fund scientific research and it would publish scientific research. That was it. There were some books, but as soon as he could offload those to the Library of Congress, he did. He didn't want to have anything to do with it. And there were suggestions and there were pressure to have a museum. He hated the idea of museums. He didn't want a museum. He wanted pure scientific research. Of course, he lost that museum idea. And now there are like 12 or more museums just in DC in the mall. But he, he didn't like that idea. He wanted it to be scientific. So it wasn't very practical. Again, very ivory tower. But at the beginning of the Civil War, needless to say, it got pressed into service. There were, uh, there were experiments done and testing of signal lighting from the towers because they were the tallest towers in the, in the country at the time, in the, in the city. Um, and, Link, and no matter how much Joseph Henry tried to keep this the Smithsonian neutral, because he, he had been friends with, with uh, Jefferson Davis before the war. Jefferson Davis had been a, dose, a, a regent of the Smithsonian. Uh, so he didn't really want to get in politics. But he nevertheless became an informal science advisor to Abraham Lincoln. He used to meet with him. Lincoln called on him for anything related to science and technology. One of the things they called on him for was the permanent commission of the Navy Department. Everybody knew Lincoln was a techie. He was a sciencey guy. It was common knowledge. And people would line up to come and say, hey, I've got a new weapon that I think would win the war. So once the war got started, it looked like it was pretty clear it was going to last a while. More and more of these people lining up to come in and see Lincoln, who originally were just asking for jobs, now they're like pitching their new ideas, uh, some weaponry that would end the war tomorrow. And Lincoln loved it. He, there were things like the Spencer repeating rifle, where instead of a musket where you have one ball in there at a time and it, you could get, maybe get two shots in a minute, there was a Spencer where you could stick a cartridge of seven shells in it and then automatically move them into the chamber and fire them very quickly. Lincoln loved this idea and he went out and tested it on what now the, the ellipse. So he was very much into it and he pressed the idea of, of ironclads. He pressed the idea of what was called a coffee mill gun, which was a very rudimentary machine gun and a lot of other technological advances. He also dealt with a lot of scientific issues, which I talk about in, in different chapters in the book, but he couldn't handle it. It's just too much. He has too many things to do. So he again called on Joseph Henry and they set up this permanent commission. So there was Joseph Henry as the chair, uh, joined by Alexander Dallas Beach, who was had been the head of the scientific Lazaroni, which basically didn't do anything during the war. 
but he at this time was the superintendent of the Coast Survey. And by the way, Bates is the great grandson of Benjamin Franklin, so he has kind of a pedigree. The third guy on this commission was Charles Henry Davis, who eventually would become an admiral and the chief of the Bureau of Navigation. And it was the job of these three men in this permanent commission to evaluate all of these new technological advances that people were proposing. Uh, some were scientific, some were technological, some were weapons, some were uh, a lot of other different aspects that people would come up to them and say, oh, we can win the war. So the permanent commission would review these, these proposals some of them they would just throw out, and to be honest, it was probably about 80% of the proposals. They just said, this is crazy, and they would throw it out. Others, they would facilitate the testing of it, either through the Army or the Navy or by the person proposing it, and they would decide what things should go forward. Now, that doesn't mean Lincoln stopped being involved. I mean, he would continue to get people coming to him, uh, pitching science and technology uh, ideas, and he would love to still do all of this. He was always going down the Navy Yard to check out new weaponry. But uh, most of the time, he would side with, the, with the, the permanent commission. Now, there's another uh, part, uh, another thing that he did to institutionalize science. In 1863, he signed into law the National Academy of Sciences. And the idea behind this was that a group of 50 charter members, scientists from across the country in different types of science would be brought together as needed to investigate, examine, experiment, and report upon any, object, any subject of science or art, art being like military art, mechanical arts, engineering, technology, not paintings, um, anything that the federal government might ask them. Uh, and one of the first things they asked them to look at was like, well, you know, we have compasses that work really, really well in these big wooden ships with sails. Not so well when you start having iron cladding surrounding a compass. How do we deal with this? So that was one of the first things they did. But they also dealt with a lot of other things. Now, I want to mention a few of these people. Uh, I have this little caption tells who these people are, but I want to point out some. Uh, the second guy in from the left is, is Alexander Dallas, B Dallas Beach. He is the first president of the academy in name, but he was sick. He had uh, uh, probably tuberculosis for a year and a half or so before he finally died. So he didn't really do much as president. Joseph Henry, the second guy, the next guy in, is was acting president and then became officially the second president of the academy. And the next guy, Louis, Louis Agassiz, is critical. He was a very highly respected Swiss-born, now American scientist at Harvard, uh, who, with the first two, Henry and Beach, were part of the Lazzaroni and had pushed the idea of the National Academy of Sciences before Lincoln, in the previous administration. But it was turned down, so we, we're, not, we're not interested. So it was Agassiz who decided to go to Lincoln and say, listen, you know what, this guy is a, is a, um, a sciencey guy, he's a techie guy, I bet you he would like this idea. So Agassiz teamed up with Senator Henry Wilson, who is the guy to the right of, of Lincoln in this painting. Wilson's from my home state of Massachusetts. He was the one who submitted the, introduced the bill in the Senate and coordinated with the bill, the same bill in the House, very end of the session, got them uh, approved by voice vote and got branded up the road to Lincoln to sign that very night. So there's some question, obviously, you know, Congress passes bills and the president signs the bill. So, you know, what did Lincoln have to do with this? He just signed the bill, right? Probably didn't even know about it. But I was able to dig up some information that suggests that he did have at least some knowledge and certainly supported the idea of the National Academy. For example, he had worked with Henry Wilson very closely the year before on the DC Emancipation Bill. They disagreed on a lot of things, but they agreed on the Emancipation Bill. And they, uh, just before the vote and while they were discussing this National Academy, he sent a note and said, please have uh, Senator Wilson come see me at the White House. Also, this next guy in the line, second from the, the right, is uh, 
<coughs> excuse me, is Davis. And um, Davis, as Charles Henry Davis, was this, he's the third guy on the permanent commission. He uh, has a letter that I was able to find that says, that suggests that he and Lincoln discussed the National Academy. So there is some evidence that Lincoln was involved in the discussions and creating a National Academy. He clearly was supportive of it and very quickly signed it. Now there's no question about how instrumental Lincoln was in the creation of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, this was another way to institutionalize science in, in the federal government. <clears throat> the national, the, the Department of Agriculture was, uh, was created in 1862, but in 1861, December of 1861, Lincoln wrote in his very first uh, annual message to Congress, so this is like the precursor to the, the uh, State of the Union, he wrote amongst many things in this annual message, he said that agriculture needs to be addressed. He says agriculture, he recognized, is the largest interest of the nation. So most Americans were still involved in agriculture. The South, obviously, because they didn't want to have anything to do with technology, which put them at a disadvantage. They were obviously mostly agriculture in the South, mostly agronomy. In the North, though, which had embraced technology, were still majority involved in, in the profession of growing crops. So he said, this is it. But we don't have a department. There's not a bureau. There's a clerkship. They're literally a dusty desk in the back of the interior department um, for agriculture. And the guy that was doing the agricultural research was doing it on his own time and he died. We need somebody, we need a bureau, we need a department of agriculture. Here he's reiterating what he had pushed in 1859, a couple of years before, at a speech he gave in Wisconsin, to the Wisconsin State Agricultural Fair. He actually berated farmers somewhat, saying, you know, you just can't keep doing this ad hoc stuff, doing whatever you've been doing. You need to bring science to farming. Now, Lincoln, of course, knew all about farming. He had grown up on a farm. He was farming for the first 21 years of his life. He hated it. He wanted to get away from it, but he understood how important it was to the country. So, but you need to have science. So this, he pressed Congress. Congress took the hint, created the Department of Agriculture, Lincoln signs it, and he puts in charge of the new Department of Agriculture a guy by the name of Isaac Newton. And yes, that's his real name. So Isaac Newton starts the process of bringing science to agriculture. So the Agricultural Department is now doing research on developing new seeds. It's doing scientific research on uh, soil nutrition, tillage practices, crop varieties, uh, crop rotation. It's doing statistics, collecting and, and analyzing statistics on, on crop growth and yields. And then it's disseminating all of this information back to the farmers so that any small farmer could get all this benefit of all of this scientific information, which was critical. Uh, now, this, this Department of Agriculture Extension Service still exists. Um, I know because in my previous job when I was a scientist, I did a lot of work where I had to collaborate and, and work with the soil and the, uh, the agricultural extension services. So it's critically important. And Lincoln got this started. Now I'll mention a few other, quickly, a few other uh, progressive acts, progressive type acts that the uh, Congress passed and that Lincoln signed. And that Lincoln had varying degrees of input on. Uh, one is the Homestead Act of 1862. Uh, one thing that the federal government had a lot of was land. When you think about it, even the beginning of the Civil War, when you get beyond uh, what was Missouri and Kansas, and then all that land beyond that to uh, California and Oregon was still territory. And it all belonged to the federal government officially. So the Homestead Act, which had been passed before and then vetoed by James Buchanan, was quickly passed by the Congress because all the people voting against it had left, seceded. So it quickly passed and Lincoln signed it. 
Now, Lincoln didn't have a lot to do with the passage of this because he had already been saying for, for years, he'd been promoting this idea for years. So he, everybody knew he was on board and he quickly signed it. Another act that was passed that Lincoln had a little bit more to do with was the Pacific Railroad Act. This is a painting called The Last Spike that was done by Thomas Hill in 1881. <coughs> it shows them putting a ceremonial golden spike into the, the Transcontinental Railroad and uh, uh, was a promontory point in Utah connecting the Pacific Union Railroad and the railroads coming from the east. Lincoln lobbied this a little bit more. He, he, he put uh, uh, Stanton and other people from the army to liaise with, with the people that were doing this to get this to happen. It was Lincoln who picked the route and the starting point at uh, Council Bluffs, Iowa for this transcontinental railroad. And like the Homestead Act, it was instrumental in the westward movement of people from, from the east and, and the populating of white people into the, the east. Now, all of these things after the war were also available to African Americans and to women, and there were many of both that went, went west. The last thing I'll mention in this group is the uh, Moral Land Grant uh, College Act. And you don't have to try to read all of these little names of colleges. This was another one that had been passed uh, in the previous Congress and then vetoed by James Buchanan. But Lincoln had spoken with Justin Morrill, who was the, the guy who had submitted it before. And he said, listen, I want to sign this thing, put it in. Lincoln had been very big on education, had said even in his very first campaign uh, announcement when he was 23 years old, years old, said that education is the most important thing that people should engage in. Is very big on, on education for the masses, not just the wealthy and the privileged. So he was all in on this. And what this did was it gave land, again, because the federal government had plenty of land, gave land and money to the states on a stipulation that those states would use this money to have a college and the college would be required to teach agricultural science and mechanical arts. So that's why you see like Texas A&M, per review A&M, a lot of these A&M is agriculture and mechanical. So we're talking science of agriculture in particular, but other sciences as well. And mechanical is technology, engineering. All of this eventually led to, now we have way over a hundred uh, different colleges. And there was a second Moral Land Grant Act in the 1890s that uh, said, well, either you could open this up to African Americans or you've got to create separate land grant colleges for African Americans, which unfortunately, a lot of places, especially the South, went towards the second route and created um, a black only colleges that were land grant colleges. But that's how we got Howard, that's how we got Tuskegee and all of these. HBCUs, uh, Historically Black Colleges and Universities, that came out of the second land grant. But the first one was passed when Lincoln was signed. He encouraged it and he, he signed it. There's one more thing I want to mention before, before I end and we go to questions. This, uh, some people should re recognize this. Uh, this is the Yosemite Valley in California. In 1864, Lincoln signed the Yosemite Grant Act. Uh, this act created, took the, uh, granted to, to California federal land in California, which was already a state, but this was federal land in California, gave it to the state of California on the stipulation that this Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa uh, big tree grove, which is the sequoias, uh, redwoods, all these big, huge trees, if you've been out there, it's beautiful, would be hold, held forever for public use, resort, and recreation. So kept in its natural state and given so that everyone can use it, all, all Americans. This was pretty amazing that in the middle of the Civil War, he put aside land for natural protection. And Lincoln was involved. I mean, again, it's hard to tell exactly how much he did and how much he started, but California Senator John Connors was the one who pushed this. Connors had met with Lincoln several times, and shortly before he introduced this legislation, he met with Lincoln. In fact, he gave him a cane from a walking stick from uh, made from wood from this area. So he was promoting this idea. Lincoln also was very big on the idea of California 
he hadn't been there, but he wanted to go there. He planned to go there in a second term. Uh, in addition to the natural areas, he was very aware that the gold rush had been there in 1849. There were a lot of million, min, mineral resources there, also in, the, in Nevada, which played an important role in Nevada becoming state. He wanted to, to set this aside um, for nature, but he also wanted California to be kind of brought closer to the rest of the United States. He thought that was very important. Now, of course, California eventually gave this back to the federal government and it became the third national park. Uh, so Lincoln didn't create the national park system, but during the middle of the Civil War, he certainly planted the seeds of what would become the national park system by creating this first natural area. Now I'll wrap this up by talking, just, just talk a little bit about this, uh, this idea of what Lincoln was looking for here. He had said in this fragment that he wrote probably in 1854 that was sort of thrown on the desk and never seen again, it says the legitimate object of government is to do for a community of people whatever they need to have done but cannot do at all or cannot so well do for themselves in their separate and individual capacities. You know, a good example of this is you cannot expect an individual farmer to do scientific research to figure out different crop schemes that might improve yields. But the federal government with support through the Department of Agriculture certainly can do that research and it can then disseminate that information down to the farmers, to individual subsistence farmers even can get this information plus new seeds that might be better for crop nutrition. So he understood this. He said that all of this, you know, his thing going in was, you know, I grew up on the frontier in poverty and without a whole lot of schooling that didn't give me a very good start. Whereas other people start with wealth and form a lot of formal education, a lot of advantages, a lot of people forced to do all their labor for them. You know, obviously we're not all starting from the same, same level. The federal government should play a role. He firmly believed the federal government should assist men to rise up to better their condition, primarily by doing things like this that, the federal government could do that individuals can't do um, and doing things to remove the artificial burdens that are put on people, poverty and in, in areas that don't have a lot of education and everything else. So we thought that education and broad practical dissemination of scientific knowledge to the public would help everyone. And that was his key. He wanted to help everyone that all men, should have an equal chance in the race of life, which are words that he used. So here we have in the Civil War, we have this existential crisis going on, whether the country is even going to survive. And during it, even when it didn't, wasn't so sure the Union was going to win the war, Lincoln and Congress still had the foresight to position the United States for the modern era. So we had all this development technological development that was just happening organically in the first half of the 1800s because of things that Lincoln did set us the way things were set up to institutionalize things more and the, and the, uh, the important areas that he, that he promoted and others promoted, not just him. Uh, we saw much faster growth, exponential growth of technology and science in the second half of the 1800s and of course into the, into the 20th century and even the 21st. So all of this was done with foresight during the Civil War, which is pretty incredible when, when you think about it. So I will end here and, uh, and take any questions that, uh, that people have. You can see my website and my uh, email address there if you wanna reach out to me later. Go Thank you, David, questions. so much. As David mentioned, it is now time to take your questions. I know several people have been typing them in the chat, so we'll start with those. But if you do have a question that you would like to ask David, now is your opportunity. So just type it in the chat and we'll try to get through as many as time allows. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Heather Fieser and I'm the program manager for Looking for Lincoln. And as I said, David, we have quite a few questions in the chat, so we'll get started right away. Okay. All right. So... In addition to the uh, Union Pacific Act, did Lincoln do other things to expand the railroad system in the United States while he was president? 
I'm sorry, I, I missed that. Say it again. Okay. So you, you talked about in your presentation how Lincoln signed the Union Pacific Act, basically starting construction on the Transcontinental Railroad. Right. In addition to that, did he expand the railroad system in any other way while he was president? Other railroad? Yeah. Like, was he encouraging other railroad development at the time? Not really, no. Um, there were, most of the railroads leading up to the Civil War were all private. And the private companies, um, they didn't necessarily uh, coordinate with each other. So there were, early on, there were a lot of different gauges, the distance between the rails. And in fact, the different companies liked to have different gauges so that people couldn't borrow their their rails for their, for their own railroads, try to like steal from them. Uh -huh. um, this was especially a problem in the South. Uh, by the Civil War, the North was much more um, standardized. And during the war, Lincoln um, effectively <coughs> nationalized the, the railway system. Wow. Uh, he, 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 got, he got authority from Congressional Act to nationalize the railroads and the telegraph companies. Uh, mostly those companies realized that, you know, this was a good deal for us. You know, we're going to make plenty of money from the federal government. So they were all very cooperative anyway. Uh, one thing Lincoln did do during the, with the Transcontinental Railroad, Pacific Railway Act, Railway Act, was to stipulate what's called the standard gauge that all railroads use now. And is that all the railroads, you know, they all have to use the same gauge, the same distance between rails. Um, and that, that is something that's also a legacy from the Lincoln time that all the railroads that we use today, even different companies, they all do the same. <clears throat> they all have to have the same gauge. That makes yeah. sense. Okay. And the, South, and the South wasn't doing it. They, <clears throat> they had all different gauges. They didn't have as much railway, railroad lines anyway. Um, a much, much less, like a, a quarter that the North had. Then they didn't have the capacity to build new ones because they didn't have the manufacturing capability. And even the railroad, the railway lines they had were more about getting cotton to the to the ports. They didn't like the idea of getting direct lines to the north because they were worried that enslaved <clears throat> people might hop a railroad and and escape. Right. So there are a lot of things that slavery did to hold back the the, the south uh, and gave advantage to the north because of that. And Lincoln recognized all of that and used it to our advantage. Okay. Here's our next question. Did Lincoln encourage or facilitate the Northern military's use of the telegraph? I'm sorry. I still didn't hear you. I'm going to try something. <clears throat> See if I can switch to this. Okay, try again. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry. Did Lincoln encourage or facilitate the Northern military's use of the telegraph? Uh, yes. Uh, you know, Lincoln, you know, he, the telegraph had, you know, was slowly gaining, gaining use before the Civil War. But, uh, you know, it really was a, uh, mostly used by the railroads. Uh, and it was used by the military a little bit, uh, but not much. There wasn't much of a military really before the Civil War. So during the, the Civil War, Lincoln uh, and others, and Stanton especially after Cameron, realized that the, um, that the uh, telegraph was, was critically important uh, for communication. So luckily the telegraph lines, you know, often ran right beside the railroad lines because <laughs> they were used by the, the, the telegraphs. In fact, uh, in a previous book I wrote, uh, Thomas Edison, who was a, a telegrapher at the time of the Civil War as a 14 year old, uh, was a railroad butch and he would use the telegraph to get information from further up the line and send it back to him. And then he would have a little printing press on the railroad and would, would put out a little newsletter to sell people on the, on the train. 
But Lincoln understood during his time, too, that this was a way for him to talk to the, the generals in the front. So now he could talk to people like, like uh, McClellan, talk. I mean, he would get messages back and forth. It wasn't quite as instant as we think of today, but you get messages back and forth. And then he could send messages and get messages from other generals in different places and, and coordinate to some respects which was not done uh, prior to the Civil War. And it was being done because the telegraph allowed doing that. Uh, and again, just like the railroads, the telegraph was something that was, uh, was private companies and Lincoln uh, was able to effectively nationalize them. But in, you know, really the, the companies just sort of all got on board to help the war effort. Okay, thank you. All right, here's our next question. Um, what was Lincoln's relationship with Lowell and the balloons during the Civil War? With balloons? Yes. Lincoln, um, the balloon corps, you know, there were several people that were pushing the idea of balloons. In the, in the war, beginning of the war. And most of them, you know, were being ignored. Uh, the, the military said, I don't need any newfangled stuff. And Lincoln was all constantly pushing against the, the very conservative views of the, the, the military who didn't want to try new things. But it was Joseph Henry who hooked up with Thaddeus Lowe. Thaddeus Lowe wasn't the first balloonist, but he was certainly the best lobbyist for ballooning. And he hooked up with Joseph Henry, who by this time was, you know, getting pretty close to, to Lincoln as far as uh, being able to talk him into things. And he introduced them and Lincoln met with Lowe. And several times, you know, he told uh, Cameron early on and then eventually Stanton that, you know, we need to incorporate, you know, have this guy put up balloons. And it was eventually he got to the point where uh, Winfield Scott, who was still in charge early on, still the general in chief, uh, he wasn't doing anything with these balloons. And Lincoln actually walked Thaddeus Lowe over to Winfield Scott's office and said, Scott, you know, talk to this guy. You know, we need to use these. Now, luckily, after Lincoln got rid of Scott, uh, and especially after he got rid of Cameron and brought in Stanton, uh, and George McClellan, one of the few things that Lincoln and McClellan agreed on was that balloons could be very important. And so McClellan bought into this idea. And between the two of them and some good lobbying on Thaddeus Lowe's part to Lincoln, including putting up a balloon on what now is the mall, National Mall, bringing up a telegraph line and sending a message down to Lincoln in the White House saying, um, I am you know, very happy to send you this very first telegraph from a balloon to the commander in chief. You know, that, you know, Lincoln was all in on the whole balloon idea and he told, he ordered the, the military to, to use it, promoted it. And for a while, balloons were very effective as a reconnaissance device. Uh, they were tethered, so they weren't just flying loose. They were tethered um, and they could be used to watch over the, the field. They were used in Second Bull Run, a few other places, Antietam. Um, but then there were problems between Lowe and the military. He wasn't getting paid, and he just said, forget it, and he just quit. They never really used balloons much after that. So they used them for a little bit, but uh, after 18, early 1863, I think, they weren't using them at all. But Lincoln was definitely very pro-balloon. OK, here is your next question. Do you know the approximate cost of the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad that Lincoln authorized? Oh, um, no, I'll, I'll check the easy way out. No, I don't, I, I don't know what the cost was. It was, uh, it was pretty expensive, but it was stretched over several years and it was a lot cheaper than running a war. <laughs> uh, you know, Lincoln several times would say, like when he, he, he would say, well, let's, let's just pay for Kentucky. We'll just pay Kentucky for the 
book value of all of the enslaved people in Kentucky and get them to emancipate the slaves. We'll pay for it. And they said, well, it costs so much money. And he says, we spend that amount of money in like a week in the, in the war. And this would help facilitate the end of the war. So he was very much, you know, I'll, I'll take a short term hit for a long term gain. And the Transcontinental Railroad was a, a relatively short term hit for a long term gain. Uh, and of course, it, you know, it took a long term. It wasn't completed until uh, Ulysses S. Grant was president. Uh, Grant was was involved in the uh, I think Grant was out there for the the, the ceremonial golden spike in, in Utah. But okay. he certainly it was during that time frame. All right, here's our next question. Did Stanton encourage Lincoln on developing technology for the war? Um, I would have to say largely no. Uh, he did a little bit. He, he sort of put up with Lincoln a lot because Lincoln was constantly pressing the military to uh, adopt technological advances for the war. Uh, but the military itself, uh, the chief ordnance officer Ripley was dead set against any of this newfangled stuff. He didn't want the Spencer repeating rifle. He said, just give me a lot of rifled muskets. And he had a point because some of this newfangled stuff was, you had, if you had, if you had one supply chain to bring in all these muskets and, and, and uh, our ordnance for them, that was a supply chain. But if you had 50 different weapons, all with 50 different types of bullets, with 50 different types of systems, and the more complicated you got, you got more and more moving parts and parts that could that could fail, that became problematic. And so the, the military in general didn't want all this new stuff. Uh, and Lincoln was constantly pushing against that. Uh, Stanton was kind of in the middle. I mean, he was in the middle. Um, and he tried to to stay in, out of it at more more times than not. Um, but in the end, a lot of these weapons, uh, some weapons like the repeating rifles and some of the things like the coffee mill gun and certainly the ironclads, they were used and they were very important during the war. Other ones like Gatling gun, which came at the very end of the war, um, Lincoln promoted that, but it was kind of late and it wasn't really put into service. There were things that just weren't practical at, at that time period. Lincoln was way ahead of his time as far as development of things, but the realities on the ground made it difficult to actually implement a lot of these. A lot of these. So there was a there was constant push and pull and Stanton was kind of in the middle on it. Okay, thank you. All right, here's your next question. Did Lincoln while president own stock or invest in any of the science companies he endorsed? Oh, uh, you know, that's a good question. I, I, uh, I won't rule out that there was something, but I would say almost certainly no. I'm not aware of any off the top of my head while he was president. There were certain interests when he was back in Illinois um, and promoting internal improvements. I mean, he, he owned some interest in land um, and there were some other places that he would invest in some of these companies that he was helping to charter in Illinois. But by the time he got to the White House, he, he wasn't really invested in any of these things and he wasn't really thinking in terms of making money off of it. Um, this really was a turning point as well, as far as before that, you know, basically everybody in Washington, all the politicians in Washington were just horribly corrupt. And they had no qualms about, you know, taking kickbacks and stuff from, from companies. Uh, Lincoln really never did that, certainly not to that extent. Uh, Stephen A. Douglas did for the Transcontinental Railroad that he was pushing when he was a senator. Uh, but Lincoln, I don't think he owned any any stock in anything major. I don't I don't think he owned any stock at all. But I'm not sure about that. So if somebody has a knowledge that proves me wrong, I'll accept that. All right. Thank you. 
All right, here's your next question. Um, what was Lincoln's view of Native Americans and the natural sciences um, that Native Americans practice? He, uh, you know, that's a big topic that's been recently that's that's come out. And one of the reasons why people have been um, vandalizing statues in, in Chicago is for Native American issues. Um, to be honest, Lincoln didn't think much about Native Americans. He pretty much had the same attitude that virtually every white American had at that time, which was that Native peoples were just sort of there and they were primitive and they were in the way and you know there was no qualms about pushing them out of the way. Uh, that was true uh, throughout America and for all history. And the, the Indian Removal Act of 1830 was, was Andrew Jackson had pushed that uh, to, to push the native peoples out of the prime uh, cotton areas in, in the South so that they, the plantation owners could expand cotton acreage. Uh, but Lincoln, Lincoln ran into some problems because you know there was a lot of, he wouldn't worry about things out, out beyond his control. So places like Minnesota, there was a, a, a Dakota uprising against poor treatment for, for years that had been going on since the beginning of our nation. And they, there was an uprising, there were a lot of people killed on both sides, and there were uh, 38 Dakota that were, that were hanged. And that's what a lot of people focus on now, but they, they forget that Lincoln actually, they actually had convicted 303 Dakota and Lincoln had commuted the, the, the executions of of 257, whatever the number is. So, um, you know, it was a difficult, it was a difficult time. I, to be honest, I don't think he really put a whole lot of thought into it. That said, he did entertain um, a group of Native American chiefs who came to the U to, to the White House. He was a bit condescending to them, to be honest, but uh, he, 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 he met with them. Uh, he used to, he would meet periodically with a guy by the name of John Ross, who was sort of an exiled uh, chief of the Cheyenne, I think, one of the five civilized tribes. Um, so he had a little bit of interaction, but he had promised others that he said, I don't have time for this, to deal with this right now. When the war's over, my second term, I will deal with the Indian system, which was horribly, had been horribly corrupt and inefficient, just a terrible system. Um, for decades, and he said, "Okay, I'll I'll deal with that in my second term once this war is over." But of course, he never got the chance to do that. So he has a very mixed track record on on Native peoples, which which all of them. I mean, to be honest, everybody had a bad track record. So if if a mixed track record might even be considered an improvement at that point, but still, okay. it wasn't great. All right, so we are winding down on time. I have two final questions for you. Okay. First, David. If people wanted to find out more about your book and the information and topics you talked about, how would they go about doing that? You can do a couple of things. One is you could buy the book, which I highly encourage people to do. It's of, available. Course, of course you do. <laughs> yes. It, it's available everywhere, all the stores and everywhere else. It's, it's, just, it's pretty far. But if you go to my website, uh, which uh, I think is in the, in the link, it's, it's uh, in the description. Yeah, it's David J. Kent hyphen writer.com. I have a lot of stories and a lot of information there about it, including if you go to, I have a tab called media. And if you go there, you can uh, look back and you know, scroll down. You'll see a lot of presentations that I've given that are on video or on podcast or an audio of some sort that you can watch about different topics. Because I, I try to do different topics, not give the same talk every time which is more interesting for me and I think for the people listening. All right. And our final question. Why do you think it's important in the 21st century to still be studying the legacy of Abraham Lincoln? Uh, I know. I, think, I like give you the loaded question at the end. Yeah, yeah. These are, these are, they said, it's actually pretty easy. All you have to do is look around and, you know, and I'm just outside Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, over the last... Uh, you 
few months, few weeks, few years, uh, decade, it's been pretty crazy. I mean, you can see that a lot of the issues that Lincoln had to deal with are still relevant today. Uh, the, the, the conflicts between races, the, what, do, what do we do about the history of slavery and then after that Jim Crow and, and uh, civil rights uh, oppression, things like that. Um, a lot of those issues are still very much in play. So I think we can look back at Lincoln and look at how he dealt with things. And what he did was he always tried to avoid demonizing the people, uh, like at the time, slaveholders. He would not demonize slaveholding. He would demonize slavery. It was immoral. But the slaveholders, he would say, well, you know, if we were in their place, we might be not so quick to get rid of slavery. And if they were in our place, they would not be so quick to start slavery. So maybe we need to work together and find a solution that helps everyone and solves the problem. So I think he was that kind of problem solver. He also, and obviously at the top of my book, he was also very much belief believed in that the federal government could play a role in evening the playing field, not socialism like it gets thrown out by everybody today, which literally was the same argument thrown out by slaveholders at the time. Social, it's all socialism, you know, but not socialism, not saying we'll give you all this stuff, just that we'll facilitate things to make it so that the luck of birth isn't what defines the rest of your life. You know, let's let's remove some of these burdens. Let's provide this scientific and technological research and then disseminate this to the masses so that all people have a chance um, to to better their better their lives, to better their condition. So I, I think that's one of the big things we can look back on Lincoln and and understand how he solved problems and how he dealt with conflicts and different motivations from different types of people. Because uh, that's certainly something we don't seem to be very good at at the moment. Well, thank you for joining us, David. Thank you to our audience for joining us tonight. Um, we will hope you will join us next month for our next broadcast and have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.